Uh, I think I'm on. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ami Klin. Uh, I direct the autism program at the Yale Child Study Center. And um, I have several colleagues who are here uh, these two days. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I think I have two traditions insofar as Autism Europe is concerned. One of them is that I come here every two years, uh, and I think I've been doing that for at least uh, 10, 12 years. And my second tradition is that they always lose my bag. So, um, you know, just to keep in uh, uh, once again, so I'm wearing the same clothes for the second day, so that's not so good. Um, at any rate, I think that uh, uh, Professor Rizzolatti's um, uh, uh, lecture was uh, a wonderful preamble to um, what I'd like to present. And Sally Rogers, my friend, uh, also presented yesterday. It seems like we all share um, sort of similar, uh, similar structures. Um, but what I would like to present to you today is um, it's basically um, two projects that we're involved in um, that uh, involve the identification of uh, markers uh, for risk uh, for autism in very young children. Um, and uh, this work is the work that um, a very close colleague of mine, Warren Jones, and I have been doing for quite some time, but uh, he, he needless to say has the contribution of several people, including Kasia Havarska, who I'm sure is here because she, she has to give the next, uh, the next presentation. So, um, what is our first goal? Um, our first goal is to um, is basically to identify uh, risk for autism even before the symptoms of autism are out there. Um, why is that so important? Well, Sally did that for us yesterday. Um, I came into this field starting to work with adults at a time in which we felt that this condition was intractable. Um, one of the greatest developments that have happened in the past several years has been the fact that we are now accompanying babies from birth, even before the symptoms of autism are entirely visible. In fact, we're finding out that if we were to wait until those symptoms were visible, we might not be able to make a diagnosis until, you know, depends for, for different children, but maybe into the second year of life. Um, we're all clinicians, um, um, and uh, we know that the diagnosis of autism in young children is um, it's hard. It's hard because um, it, it varies tremendously um, from child to child, um, and because um, as we follow those children from the first and second year of life until later on, we find out that there is a tremendous amount of change and variability. Um, yes, it is possible for us to make reliably clinical diagnosis in the first three years of life, um, but when uh, it's something that varies from child to child and the stability of that diagnosis is also something that um, we need to pay attention to. So we took um, um, a, a different approach. Um, our approach is that um, uh, autism in many different ways uh, refers to the disruption of uh, very, uh, very early emerging and evolutionarily very highly conserved mechanisms of socialization. Uh, babies are, um, are born in this um, extreme state of utter fragility. Um, if they are not taken care of, they wouldn't survive. So it stands to, um, it stands to, uh, uh, to reason that nature would endow, would endow those babies with things that would push them towards other people. And uh, we have focused on several of those mechanisms of socialization. For example, uh, biological motion, the emotion of living beings, uh, something that not only humans do, but other animals do, do too, or from, 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 from primates, as we heard, all the way to, um, to newly had chicks. It's part of the basic mechanisms of imprinting. Um, or fixation on the eyes. Um, uh, the eyes are not only the window to the soul, the eyes are also the window to social neuroscience. Uh, it's a way that we get into uh, the body, the mind, the heart of others. And, um, and another thing that I'm going to um, be showing a little bit to you today, it's also the concept of social entrainment, which basically means that there are many things out there that we could pay attention to, but if, you, if we were to have a sense of collective consciousness in sort of little children, we find out that we tend to pay attention to the same thing at the same time. Uh, the reason being that uh, the world is not flat in terms of its salience. We pay attention to things that are adaptively very important to us. Um, and what is our long goal, um, uh, our, our long-term goal is basically to uh, be able to capitalize on these early mechanisms of socialization to, um, to use them for uh, measuring disruptions in, in, in course in children who eventually will develop autism. 
And what I'm going to present to you is, um, is some work on, um, on uh, baby siblings. These are siblings of children with autism that we accompany from birth and um, who are at a greater genetic risk of also developing autism. And we decided that we're going to do that very intensively. So the children come to us and we start seeing them when they're born and we see them every month until they are about six months and every three months thereafter until 24 months. Um, the clinical diagnosis is made at 24 and then at 36 months. Um, what do we want to do? Um, as a clinician, it's very frustrating to me when I'm talking to a parent who is concerned about their infant and they bring it to the pediatrician and the pediatrician puts a questionnaire in their hands. Uh, this doesn't happen in other areas of medicine. We would like to have methods. We would, have, we would like to have instruments, tools, that would allow us to both identify the condition, but also prescribe treatment. A lot of treatments in pediatrics are like that. They both give you a diagnosis, but they're also prescriptive. They allow to give you a sense of what the treatment should be. And in that sense, one of the uh, limitations in autism, which is our second goal today, is, is can we quantify that social disability in, an, in a kind of objectified, quantified manner? Uh, we have to be able to do that because um, in all of the other areas of research in our field, whether it is genetics or if it is uh, neuroscience, we need a, a, a quantitative trait. We need to potentiate the power of those various methods by having something that is going to quantify how autistic is the person or how socially disabled is that, is that person. And that's something that I'm going to discuss too. Um, now, uh, for me, life starts with children. And, um, and this is a 50-month-old that I was seeing many years ago, and she was showing to me something that we don't find very often when we are interacting with typically developing children. <laughs> you blocked me with Steffi, you remember? You had to, oh, yeah, you had to put those things up. So, let me do one thing here. Uh, we are hearing from Professor Rizzolari about, about our physical space. If I did that, if I think anybody here, particularly if it was a female, uh, if I came about an inch away from Donata's um, sort of eyes, she would do two things. She would recoil and she would call the police. Um, but this happens with children too. The moment that we are in the presence of another, our own being changes. And that's something that was not happening with this little girl. And we have to find a way of, uh, of trying to measure that. So this is what we did. Um, we use eye tracking technology to basically see the world through the eyes of this little girl. And what you see here in this cross, uh, this cross tells you exactly what she's looking at at every moment of time. And as we're showing basically a mother-like figure trying to entreat her, trying to engage her, this is what she was doing. Hi, sweetie. Are you ready to wake up? Come on, did you sleep well? Oh, come on, come to mommy, let's get up. Good, here you come. Well, we turn up that she spends a lot of time looking at this woman's mouth. And sometimes she alternates with objects and things of that nature. And that's very different. Because from the time that babies are just a few, a few hours of age, they tend to pay uh, greater attention to the eyes of another person. So much so that by four days, they prefer to, um, uh, to look at people who are looking at them rather than people who are not. Well, um, we conducted the study. And uh, I'm being very dexterous using sort of one hand to operate two things now. Um, and in this, um, in this study, basically, we divided that um, mother-like figure into several different regions, the eyes, the mouth, the body, and the object. And in this study, uh, we're able to show that uh, two-year-olds with autism spend much, much less time looking at eyes than both typically developing two-year-olds and also a group of uh, two-year-olds who are cognitively delayed and language delayed. So these are non-autistic but developmentally delayed children. This is an important group for us because if, uh, if they perform like the typical children, basically means that what we found is specific to autism. Okay? And uh, the children with autism spent much more time looking at the mouth, and the other two groups did not. Uh, now, uh, another thing, if I do that, um, um, I basically have here the same data, um, but I'm just uh, trying to, to emphasize one thing. This is the percent of fixation time to the eyes and the mouth in the children with autism, but you see here there are two lines. And those two lines are virtually identical for uh, both the cognitive delay and the typically developing children. And what this is telling us is that even though those children had about, on average, about a year delay at the age of two, 
they still perform very much like the typical children, which basically means that what we're tapping on is something very, very fundamental, something that the delay is not having much impact. Another thing that was interesting to us is that our quantified measure of eye fixation, the percent of time that they fixated on the eyes, was actually very predictive of how, uh, how autistic they were. So this is a, a standardized instrument of, um, of basically social disability. And what we have is that the less people look at the eyes, the more autistic they were. Um, and so that kind of gives us a sense of what is the model that we want to follow to try and understand this condition. Uh, from a genetic standpoint, and there are a lot of genetic presentations here, and I spent a lot of time with my colleagues, uh, molecular geneticists, uh, over here, uh, there are many, many, many causes of autism. Uh, there are now over a hundred different genes if, or, or, or genetic mechanisms that have been associated with autism. So what we have is that we have, and I promise you, <laughs> there are going to be many, many more. Somebody mentioned that it's almost as if every child with autism is genetically unique. So how do we go from something that is uh, uh, etiologically or causally very, very, very heterogeneous to something that despite the variability that we see in autism, it's a kind of a unitary condition? Meaning people like me, I walk into a playroom and I still recognize a child of autism. So the question that we're asking now is not where the heterogeneity of autism comes from, but where does the homogeneity of autism comes from, given that there are so many causes. And here is our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that autism should not somehow be mapped back into genes, because genes don't call for behavior. Genes call for proteins and so forth. But what brings this condition together is what is the normative process that is disrupted. Every child needs to, be, needs to go through a process of socialization. This is what everybody does. So our idea is that autism is really the disruption of those early mechanisms of socialization. So if so, then what can we do? We don't need to wait for the symptoms to emerge. We can quantify those mechanisms of socialization and any disruption thereof will be a sign of risk for autism, okay? Now, um, so this is now my colleague Warren Jones and, um, and um, uh, sort of a, a unique um, eye tracking system in which we are now conducting those kinds of experiments with babies from the time they're born. Um, they're happy. They look at mother-like figures, speaking to them, and they love it. Uh, so we have uh, over 80% of success in conducting those, uh, those forms of experimentation. It took a little bit of time. Uh, I don't think that if we try to change diapers that uh, we don't reach a level of 80% success. Uh, anyway, but this is the model. Um, if, you, if you take your child to a pediatrician, you have a growth chart, okay? Um, I want to know how um, uh, 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 your, your child's weight, your child's height, uh, and then if, God forbid, there is some kind of a deviation in those growth charts, you'll say, oh my God, you should be worried about. So what do we want to do? We want to create growth charts of social engagement, very much in the same way, so that we can push this kind of research all the way to the first uh, you know, hours and days and weeks of life, and any disruption in the development of those fundamental uh, mechanisms of socialization will be a measure of risk. 